Hi, I guess I'll continue the namaste. Um, covenants. Anne Marie asked me to do something. And it was, here I am a lawyer. We talk about covenants all the time. And my first thought, and when I saw that Dave Bell's doing the meditation, I thought, oh my goodness, they got a, law a lawyer on covenants doing the reading, a lawyer doing the meditation, and we'll be hearing from a rabbi. So, <laughs> um, but it, even though I'm used to covenants, and Dave is too, it's not an easy topic to bring it into the, to the uh, to, for me to bring it into the spiritual setting. So I thought maybe I should just read a simple definition of covenant before my spiritual reading. So what's the simple definition? It's an agreement or promise between two or more parties with obligations on both sides. Spiritual meaning of covenant. A conditional promise made by, to humanity by God. For example, the agreement between God and the Israelites um, in which God promised to protect protect them if they kept God's law and were faithful to God. So if you were puzzled by the word covenant, maybe that gives you a start. And I looked all over the place for a reading and I ended up back to somebody you know is one of my favorite spiritual writers, John Pavlovitz, who comes from a Christian perspective. It's titled, No, God Doesn't Bless America. But heads up, <laughs> um, this is, as we get into it, it is about covenants, okay? God doesn't bless America. No, this isn't some kind of inflammatory, fear-filled threat that lots of evangelical pastors prefer to major in these days. It's simply a reminder that God doesn't bless America and never has blessed America for the same reason that God doesn't curse America. God doesn't see America. The heart of the Christian story is that God is not a nation maker or an empire builder. God is a soul lover. The first few words of one of the most universally known passages of scripture are as follow. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Well, those words, rever words reveal something powerfully beautiful about the massive scope and yet the startling intimacy about God's love. It is universe-sized, but it is individually delivered. It is bigger than a continent or a nation or a government. It turns out that God's been creating and speaking to and blessing people long before America was even a gleam in Mother England's eye. <laughs> I like that too. <laughs> God is not America's prosperity. God's agenda is not America's prosperity, nor dominance, nor success. And God's reach is not confined within our own borders. To say that God blesses America is to claim we have the market or cornered on reflecting the image of the divine. Pavlovitz goes on to say, I understand patriotism. I get loving from where you come from, and I understand how pr proximity naturally breeds affinity. When we imagine America as being specifically blessed, we replace God's will with our own desires, and then we act as if divinity is on our payroll. <laughs> we can then easily just, you see why I like his writing. <laughs> you know, we can easily justify seeing these beyond our borders as inferior or dangerous or even evil. The simplified story of the Christian faith is as follows. God uses a people, the Israelites, to be a model for the world, a way to reveal God's character. God makes a covenant, there's our word finally, um, with Abraham to be, quote, father of many nations, un unquote. And in this first covenant, God is reaching, reached through following rules and laws. Well, when the Israelites are unable to, to follow the rules to perfection, God sends Jesus and makes a second covenant. And this time, God is not reached through rules, but by faith. And God creates a new people one not marked by government or borders or geography, but by belief and because of their belovedness. In other words, not, God is not about franchising out of the American dream, and we should never operate under that assumption. In a letter to a church, 
pastor named Paul, we all know who he is, in, at least if you brought up in the Christian faith. Um, that's me and a lot of us here. In writing to an early Christian community, he gives these words, quote, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is in all and is all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Paul reminds his listener that all barriers and divisions, all designations, labels, borders, bloodlines, are human-made. This is a life-altering truth that can change how we see everything. And Pavlovitz continues saying that he is a Christian. When he began to live bigger than God bless America, four things happened for him. One, God gets right-sized. Instead of being an employee of my country, God becomes the eternal, perfect, unfathomable creator of the world whose name or likeness or will aren't up for sale. Two, compassion widens. A child in the suburbs of Detroit or in Africa becomes as important to me as one of my own in my own house. Three, my purpose changes. My goal will no longer be to, to get everyone to live like America, or to emulate America. I won't look out to franchise my culture or my lifestyle. And four, justice goes viral. I'll no longer deem suffering outside my country as more tolerable than that which happens within it. I will become a citizen of the world and a lover of humanity. And Pavlovitz closes with these words. Love your country, treasure your homeland, be proud of where you came from. Celebrate this nation, but never believe that God blesses America. God loves the world. Thanks.